amen and amen. Again, it's good to see you all in the house of the Lord this evening. We welcome you. God is good. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Just want to share a quick announcement with you. Uh, don't forget, of course, Sunday morning, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., we are um, going to have our pastor, C.J. Brummett, back in the house, uh, in the pulpit. Amen. Hallelujah. We're excited about that. And uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, it's been, it's been, I know they've had a great, great time. And I'm going to give the mic to him here in just a minute uh, and let him share whatever he would like. Uh, but just want to uh, say is we're excited uh, to have you all uh, back with us at home. Our family, I'll say, is not fully complete because there's more chairs. But, but we're more complete tonight because you're back, and we're so grateful for you all to be here. And also want to remind you that uh, New Beginnings, we're having a NBCH at the Arvest Ballpark coming up on the very last Friday night of this month. And I will have some tickets on Sunday if you would like. It's a fundraising event for New Beginnings, so basically half the tickets uh, price, which is $9, will go. So uh, I'll have tickets here if you want some. Uh, just take as many as you like, and, and uh, we can take care of that uh, out in the foyer uh, after service on Sunday or pro possibly even next Wednesday night as well. So I want to remind you about that. Um, so, Pastor, would you like to come and, and just give us a word? Would you give him a hand as he comes tonight? Hallelujah. I told, I told Ken just a minute or two because I know I get time on Sunday, but I just got to tell you, we, we are so ready to be back. Um, it really was perfection. The Lord really worked every detail just perfectly. And we, uh, while we enjoyed our time, we, we wouldn't want to cut it short because, like I said, the Lord orchestrated it, but we were homesick, getting homesick about a week and a half ago, uh, more so than before. But I just got to tell you the freedom that we feel in this place. We, while I don't mean this negative towards any churches, we were in six different churches while we're gone, and precious people that we met in those churches, but it wasn't the same. And I know everybody might be partial to church, but there's just a freedom here that we we didn't know. We've been here for you know going on 11 years, and don't get out much to other churches. Um, and like I said, they were a blessing to us, and and we we met wonderful people, but we were just so hungry to be back. And we miss you guys. You know, um, in time, during messages, there'll be little tidbits that God's put in my heart that I'll bring out from our trip. It won't all be in one message. It'll just be here and there. But overall, the main thing Jen and I said several weeks back is when we knew that the Lord sent us away to just show us, to prove to us ourselves how much we love you. And we love what he's doing here. And we love being here. And I know some people joked about it. You're not going away to find another church or anything. They're like, no way. After what I, after being out there and, and uh, you know, just it was never the intention or even an inkling. But we just want you to know we are so excited. And I'm so ready to reach this community for Jesus. But, you know, um, and I don't want to spoil Sunday, but I just tell you, uh, the scripture tells us, he who the sun sets free is free indeed, and freedom is awesome. But you know, there's some people that think freedom is just being able to do what they want. But Jesus promises life and life more abundantly. And the one thing that is abundantly clear to me through our, our stay and some of the beautiful scenery we saw and all is God has got so much for each and every one of us to have life and have it abundantly. And I don't even think we're scratching the surface of what he wants to unleash for you and your family in this church and I mean that. He just rekindled something in me and showed me that there is living and then there's living. And, and I think God wants to bring some real living, living waters to the, the spirits of the people here. But again, um, I'm not saying this because we're pastors here. You know, one of the things I did tell Ken, I said, my hope was when we left is that you guys wouldn't need us, that you'd find out you really don't need us to minister to this community but you'd want us back. <laughs> we wanted you to want us back because we wanted to come back and we wanted to, to lead. But to see how well things went when we were gone and uh, how, how uh, y'all really just kept ministering to one another, that was a blessing to us. So anyway, I'm excited to hear Pastor Ken here tonight. We were in some places with hardly any internet service or sometimes no cell service, so I just started watching the previous messages. And... Uh, we got through 
I think, all but Father's Day yet and got to listen to the speakers. So we're just working our way through, seeing what you experienced while we are gone. But we love you guys. We really do. Um, I don't even know if I could really convince you uh, with words. We just hope that as we walk life together from this point forward, you'll just see it. You'll see how much we love you. So. Amen. God is good. And all the time. Yes, he is. Amen. Well, open your Bibles tonight if you would like, uh, or open your apps to 12, uh, 12th chapter of Hebrews, verses 1 through 3. We'll go there in just a little bit. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. But over the course of the messages that I've given over the past uh, Wednesday nights that I've uh, spoken, We've talked about racing with endurance, and then we've kind of stacked on a variety of different things, and, and we talked about, uh, and I'll do just, just a very brief recap, and the definition of endurance is the fact or power of enduring an unpleasant or difficult process or situation without giving way, without giving way. And that's the, the noun. The adjective is denoting or relating to a race or other sporting event that takes place over a long distance or otherwise demands great physical stamina. And in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, it talks about that. And Paul, the writer of the book of Hebrews, compares the Christian life to a race. And some of the same things that, which are essential to being victorious in a race on this earth are also key to being victorious in our lives as believers. And this evening I want to take a look at just a few, just a few highlights of some of the first couple of messages. And number one, we learned that faith is essential. Faith is essential. We must have faith to enter the race. The Christian life begins by placing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. It is through faith in his shed blood and his resurrection that we enter this race of life. We must have faith to endure in the race. So we learn about faith and the fact that it is essential to our walk, not only in the beginning as we uh, pursue, as Christ pursues us and, and we follow him in faith, but we also have, must have faith as we endure through our journey. Secondly, we learn that freedom is essential. Freedom is essential. And we talked about how track teams, as they would train in high school or in other uh, in colleges, universities, some of those track teams, they would put weights and wrap them around their ankles or on their wrists during, during practice times. And they would run around. It would help make them stronger as they were having to, to lift those things. But when it was time to enter the race, what did they do? They needed freedom, so they took those weights off as they began to run. A runner knows that he won't be effective if he's weighed down. I learned, I learned this here uh, a few weeks back. Uh, I've, I've been enjoying uh, riding my bike, and uh, it doesn't have a motor on it. These are the motors right here. And uh, one of our, our brothers, uh, Kent, uh, Beckloff, he's in usually in our early service on Sunday mornings. Uh, some of his family and me and Devin, we went and took a bike ride, and he had, he has a a bike that's that's carbon. It's, it's it's made out of carbon. It's very very light. I didn't realize that at the beginning, and then I have my bike, and you know it's like a ton. Uh, yeah, I didn't I really didn't think it was that heavy, but you know it's 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 heavy. And so we got out, and we rode, and there were some hills, and he was like, oh boy, I know you've been riding a while. I hope you don't you know run off without me and stuff. Well, I found it was kind of the other way around. He was hauling up the hills, and I was just barely getting it up those hills. Well, we run about 14 miles, and then once we get and we're coming back home, he said, hey, why don't you try, try my bike out? I'm like, well, sure, okay. So, and I'm not thinking, I don't have no idea really that it's that, that light. Well, I get on that thing, and I'm smoking him. I'm gone because I'm used to really pushing, pushing that weight. And, that, and when I was free of that weight, and then a couple of minutes later when he decides to show up and I stop and I wait on him, he looks at me and goes with some sweat running down and all that and going, 
I, I'm not going to be very judgmental now that, I, that I've rode your bike. So after that, I had to go out and get another bike, which I did today. <laughs> And it's way lighter. You can take that one and just bear it. I mean, it's just, it's not quite as light as his, but it's close. It's probably 10 to 12 pounds lighter than my own bike, uh, or my, my original bike. And so I'm going to smoke him when he gets back from vacation. But what do we got to do? We've got to get off the weight. We've got freedom is essential. Freedom is essential. And there are some things that we must lay aside. So we've talked about why faith is essential. We've talked about why freedom is essential. And number three, in our earlier messages, we talked about that our focus, our focus is essential. We must focus on Christ. Not many races are won by turning around and looking. I didn't, I didn't turn around and look too much. Now, this morning, I was in my uh, strength and conditioning class, and um, I looked around, and I seen nobody. You know why? When we was running. We had about uh, 1,200 meters we had to run uh, in between uh, the first round. And everybody is gone. So I'm, not, I'm just looking ahead. But when I'm looking, my focus is just one foot in front of the other. I'm not looking, I'm be honest with you, I'm not even looking at them. Because I'm not concerned about their time. I'm not concerned, and we weren't racing. But at the same time, I'm, I'm concerned about myself finishing. So my focus had to be one foot in front of the other. If I looked at them, I would get a little discouraged because one guy's laughing, and he's halfway around the other building. And if I did turn around and look back, he might be ready to lap me. But I had to keep my focus so I could finish the race. Not many races are, are, are won by looking behind or staring up into the stands. It's important in the Christian race that, that we are running to something. We're running to something. I was encouraged here recently as we've made, had some changes with, with uh, new beginnings, and we'll share some of those things here in the near future hopefully sometime. But I was encouraged to run to the new goal that God had placed in front of us, not away from the other. And that's very important in our, our, our walk. As God puts things out in front of us, new missions, new plans, new directions, that we are focusing on running to, not away from. And I encourage you that tonight. We talked about strength and conditioning. It's the physical and psychological development of athletes for elite sport performance. And the role of that strength and conditioning plays uh, in exercise, specifically to improve performance. We had... Um, uh, we had a max out week in our strength and condition and with, with some of the weights this week. And, and sometimes you don't realize how much you can really do. But when you've been consistent, I'm in my fourth month. And there's a lot of guys, they, they're lifting a lot more weight than me. So I'm just proud of, you know, the, the few that I'm lifting. But when I did a deadlift this week, he said, I want you to max out. So we went. And I got in this bar. And I'm like, we're running out of space to put weights on this bar. I, I, I thought that was pretty cool. But, but then you get down there. And I lifted 315 pounds deadlift. And I was like, and I, could, I got it. I barely got it. I held it, and then I just dropped it, and you move your toes and watch out. But the point is, it's putting one foot in front of the other. It's, it's lifting a five-pound weight for a week. And then when you can go to 10, go to 10. When you go to 20, you go to 20, so forth and so on. It's a continual focus on the goal and to move forward. The benefits of strength and condition we talked about, as with many other types of exercise, can actually increase your metabolism, help you lose weight, maintain a healthy lifestyle, creating stronger muscles through strength and condition. You can burn more calories, keep the, unpounded, the unwanted pounds off. But to do that and to be strengthened and conditioned, what are we talking about? We talked about habits. We talked about habits that we must put in place, and we talked about seven different habits of being effective Christians. And we're not going to go through all those tonight, but uh, we, we talked about those things. And these are actions that are ingrained in us that have become natural because of the continued repetition. Those things like reading the Word, like prayer, like focusing on, on, on Christ, those different things that we must do. There are things that we do without even thinking, but accomplished with skill and precision. We talked about wanting to be effective. It's one thing to have proper habits and those kind of things, but we also want to be effective. And this word refers to the quality of our lives and our service. People can be Christians. They can be deacons, preachers, elders in, in name or title. They can put, any, put anything in there. But to be an effective person 
as a disciple of Christ or effective in whatever ministry he's placed us, it means that we must produce fruit in our personal spiritual lives as well as in our particular ministries areas. A person can wear a title any day without actually being effective. And it's important that we create habits and we cre create different things that we can be effective in Christ. So that's the recap. But tonight we're going to talk about, and it goes right along this with, with this. We're just going to kind of continue out with this tonight. And we're going to talk about going the distance. 30 meter here. It's going to be very, very difficult for Michelle Finn here. Future Olympian to rein this one in. She's got too much of a gap. Can she hold out of CIT here in third place? as DCU set off at a strong pace. This UCC look good in fifth. And look that they were passing DCU to fourth place. The big battle here is the second column. It is. It's between Cork and that oh, is UL at the moment. Soon. CIT and UL. But can the UCL is standing and Michelle Finn to turbo blast and jets of the steeple chill specialist. Oh. About being turned on with 250 to go. Eight meters to get there. Six meters. Oh, five you meters. Are gonna get this she is going to go past the UCL. It is out of her feet. Michelle Finn, the future Olympian, powers on by. Here comes CIT. Another effort in the home straight. And here comes UCL. Did you see her? At first, when you were first watching that video, you probably seen the one that was out in front, and then you turned around, and then there was one not too far behind her, and she, boy, she was really coming up on her and past her. And when I first seen the video, I thought, man, that's what this is all about. This is all about that number two place, and she's really coming. Up. But no, no, no. You wait just a little bit longer, and the focus and the determination and the consistency and the stride and staying in her lane, that one in the very, very back. Then finally, as she come around, she finished, and she, she beat everybody out. Even though the majority of the race, she was lacking. But she wasn't really lacking. She was pacing. She was keeping focus. She was staying exactly where she needed to be. She went the distance. Let's look at Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Let's, it's up on the screen for you. Let's, let's read that together with you tonight. We're going to start with verse 1. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Hebrews 12, 1, 2, and 3. I heard a story about a guy in high school. His name was Mark. He played football for the uh, Prairie City Panthers, he was a fullback, and in that high school team, he was a little bit bigger than a lot of the running backs, and he weighed somewhere between 180 to 190 pounds. And because he was short and stocky build, he could usually plow straight through ahead and pick up four or five yards every time, about every carry. 
He dragged linemen with him. Coaches used to kid him about his running ability, even though he was very, very successful in the position that he had. But the coach would give him a hard time. They say, "Hey, Mark. Mark can beat just about anybody off the line, but after five or ten yards, even the linemen catch up with him. He was good for the short sprint, but not for the open field." Now, in track, some people are built for the 100-meter sprint. That'd probably be me. But just 100 meters, boom, I'm finished. We did 1,200 meters the first time this morning, and I was last place. But it was, like I said, it wasn't a race. It was a, it was a completion, and I finished. But then we went around and did some stuff inside. We come back out and did another 800 meters. Then we had to come back out and do another 400 meters. Some people are built for the long haul. There was some in that. They were just hoofing like it was nothing, and then the, uh, there was me. Some people's built for the sprint, and some people's built for the long distance. I've always admired those who can run cross country and those who train for marathons. Anyone can survive 100 meters, just, just about anybody. But 26 miles is a real test of endurance. That same guy, Mark, said, fast forward about a decade later, and he was in uh, leadership at a Christian school. He put the challenge out to all the kids in that Christian school. He said, we're going to have a jog-a-thon. And he told them that I would buy a Coke for anyone who could run more laps than I did in an hour. Remember, this was 10, 10 years later. Big mistake. He said he ran somewhere between 26 and 27 laps. And there were several kids who got close to 30. He says, I was so sore after that, I think I walked funny for a week. You see, he hadn't really prepared for that race. He said, I was not in shape for running. I was not prepared to go the distance. Well, today I want to share a few thoughts from Scripture about how to prepare for and run the race of our lives. Congregation, we can go the distance, and we can finish well. If we prepare ourselves and keep the right focus throughout the race. What is the right focus that will help us to finish the race well? Well, our text gives us three different words of encouragement that I believe will help us all tonight as we run the race and go the distance. Here's the first word. Lighten up. Lighten up. In verse 1 of chapter 12, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything, everything, everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. It says, let us throw off everything that hinders. You know, the writer encourages believers to get rid of anything that would slow us down or hinder from running the best race in life. We're not, he's not talking about sin in this part, in that p particular piece. That's addressed here immediately following because it says anything that hinders and sin, that so easily entangles. So that, that means there are things that could tie us up. There's things that could get in our way. There's things that can hinder us that are not necessarily sinful. They're not necessarily wrong. They're maybe not be immoral or anything like that. But at the same time, there's things that, that get in the way of our continued journey. So lighten up. I heard there's a, there's a terrible, terrible story about a man who went out to play golf early one Saturday morning. His wife became very, very concerned when he hadn't returned home by dinner time. He left that morning. He still hadn't come home. It wasn't until about midnight when he, we entered the door. He was exhausted, just worn out, exhausted. And... Where have you been? She, I mean, she's just about out of her mind. I've been playing golf. But that was 18 hours ago. What happened? He said, I was having the best, absolute best. Did I say the absolute best game of my life? I was two under par when on the seventh tee, Harry had a heart attack and died. That's his playing buddy. His, his wife was still shaking her head. I just don't, I don't get it. I don't understand. He said, after that, 
It was hit the ball, drag Harry. Hit the ball, drag Harry. Hit the ball, drag Harry. <laughs> Is there something or someone that's slowing you down? That's not true. At least to my knowledge, it's not true. But what do we do? We're having the best, what we think is the best thing in life, yet we'll do something and we'll, we'll drag some weight and we'll hang on to that. Maybe, maybe we're concerned that we, we maybe hurt somebody. Maybe we'll, you know, there's, you know, who knows? But we drag, we continue to drag the weight, and, but we're not effective and we're not successful. We've got to lighten up. In keeping with the illustration of a runner who's trained for a race, the idea of losing all excess weight or mass may be in view here. If you've ever watched Olympic runners compete, you rarely see much mass on them. They're very, they're very small. That's, that stuff is for bodybuilders and wrestlers. The runners are usually very, very lean because they literally run all the excess fat off their bodies. The spiritual application is obvious. Don't let yourself... Get out of shape spiritually through lack of exercise or because of an imbalanced diet of things that really do not strengthen us for the race. Another possible idea is the excess clothing. If a runner were to wear a tunic or a cloak or other heavy clo clothing, he would soon tire, overheat. He wouldn't do well. The point here. The point that uh, the author of this passage is making for the believers to whom he is writing is that we need to be willing to throw aside anything and everything that would hinder our relationship of love and obedience with Jesus. We must eliminate anything that slows down our spiritual growth and progress. What are some examples of these hindrances? They could be a variety of things. There are many things that are not moral. I've mentioned that already. Or, you know, they're not morally wrong to do or, or to have, but they can sometimes encumber us, keeping us from becoming all that God wants us to be. One example, I, I hesitate to use this, but I'll go ahead and use it. One example is simply money. It's not inherently bad. There's nothing wrong with money. Money's not evil in and of itself, but Paul writes that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But money itself is not. So sometimes we can get caught up in making a living that we forget to make a life. I know people who are workaholics who find their total identity in what they do for a living. They have little or no time for their family or for God because they're working day in and day out, night after night, to achieve a certain standard of living. Almost without exception. Most spouses and children would gladly go without some of the things that money could buy simply to have that family member there, to have them around to enjoy life and to teach them about life. And I've seen this example, and I thought it was very interesting. What if, wouldn't it be interesting if we quit using money as our medium of exchange and start using time instead? Start using time. What if instead of paying a $50 bill to fill up the gas tank, that actually cost you four to five hours of your life? When you think about it, that's pretty much how it works. I know today in the truck, I think I put about $53 in there. That's several hours of life in the tank. When you think about it, that's how it works. We invest time and training in a job so we can have money to spend on what we need and what we want. The more things we want, the more our lives we exchange for them, not only through working for the money, but in the maintenance, security, time spent using them and worrying about them. I want to make it very clear that I'm not suggesting we sh should do, with, do away with recreation. I'm for that. I plan on doing so. We shouldn't do away with recreation and never spend a dime on things we enjoy. I believe it's proper. I think it's good. But I think it's all in, in, in how it's done. However, we need to ask ourselves about the return on the investment. If I buy this snowmobile, is it really worth the months of my life that I will exchange to earn the money for it? We not only need to budget our money, but we need to budget our lives in a way that make 
us most effective as we run this race of life. There are things that may slow us down or stop our progress in the race. Could be relationships, could be worldly cares, or just daily business of life. It's very simple, very easy to, to, to do. These are all part of life, but should not hinder us from loving and serving our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us throw off the sin that so easily entangles us. In addition to things that would just weigh us down, we must throw off and guard against any sin that would trip us up while we're running. If we have started compromising in any areas of our life, we must get rid of the sin and renew our commitment and keep running towards Jesus Christ. The author doesn't seem to have any particular sin specific that he, he, he mentions, but is simply warning about sin in general. If we do not guard ourselves, sin can creep in the hidden areas and cause us to stumble. Paul warned the Corinthians about this in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 12 and 13. It says, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will always provide a way so that you can stand up under it. God will help us avoid sin if we will humbly trust him and count on him to help us. However, if we do, and we will, let's be quick to repent and turn away from whatever it is that's offensive to God. Our progress will be great if we will get rid of anything that slows us down or the sin that trips us up. Another way we can go the distance and run the race well is found in where we keep our focus. So we talked about lightening up. Number two, we talk about look ahead. Look ahead. The latter part of verse 1 of chapter 12 in Hebrews says, Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. If you noticed in the video of that race, there was marked places. There was lanes. There was places there. Each person, when they began, had a place that was marked out specific for them. There was a starting point. There was an ending point of where they ought to be. Same as it is for us as we follow Christ. There's a place specific to us, for us, in this race. That's not made for anybody else but, but for us. It's marked out for us. We need to know where we're going we do have a goal before us, and this race has been marked out for us since the beginning of time. In Philippians 3, verse 14, it says, Press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Heard the story of a few years back in an NCAA cross-country championship held in Riverside, California. There was 123 of the 128 runners that missed the turn. They missed it. So you've got five folks that, that caught it. One competitor, Mike Del Cavo, Del Cavo, I believe is his name, stayed on the 10,000-meter course and began waving for fellow runners to follow him. But he was only able to convince four other people to come along and go with him. When he was, when asked what his competitors thought of his mind, or excuse me, of his mid-race decision not to follow the crowd, here's how he responded: he "said They thought it was funny that I went the right way. They thought it was funny. They're probably cracking as they're running. They're thinking, where, where in the world's he going? When all the time they're just hoofing in the wrong direction." Isn't that so interesting if you think about it in today's society? There's so many people that's just hoofing in the wrong direction. And they look at you and go, why are you going the right way? What's, what's pleasant about that? What's right about that? But he, this one guy, Del Cavo, was the one who ran correctly. And in the same way, our goal 
is to run correctly, to finish the race marked out for us by Christ. As we run the race marked out for us, each of us has a path that is unique to, to yourself and to myself. And we've all faced our own struggles and trials. God has purpose and he has a plan for our lives, both individually and corporately. He has prepared you, he's prepared me to do something in his family that no one else can do in the exact same way that you can do. He prepared each of us a place. Have you found your purpose? Do you have a sense of what God has gifted you for? Why are you here? What are you good at? What are you passionate about? There is a race marked out for you. In one sense, we're all running the same race. Agreed? We're all going to the end goal. But in another sense, we all have unique path that we must take. In that race, as they were running around, as I've already said, each one had their, their lane. They had their, their spot. But the goal was the same at the end. The race is marked out. Stay on the right path. Don't look for shortcuts in life. Usually they'll bring you up short of the goal. Do not try to take somebody else's path. Go your own path that he gives you, I mean his path, but go the one that he's given to you specific. Do it God's way. I encourage you to ask him about your path, and we're going to have an opportunity to do that tonight. But don't get too uptight about it. I found that trusting him each step of the way ensures that we will stay on the path that he's chosen for us. Trust him. Simply be obedient to what he asks you to do. Next, let us run with perseverance. Lengthen your stride. This is a long-distance run. This race is not a short sprint but a marathon, and we're in it for the long haul. And we talked about some things in, in one of those, uh, I believe it was the second message in this series, that we talked about seven habits of highly effective Christians, highly effective believers. Those, those seven habits, those things are, are setting the stride. They're setting the pace for your life. We must make up our minds that we're going to hang in there. Even we are exhausted from the trials of the race. At our lowest points, we may feel like throwing in the towel, stopping the fight. However, we must keep going. I'm here tonight to say hang in there no matter how messy it gets. Stick with it no matter how tiring it gets. Never give up no matter how discouraged you may get. Perseverance is the capacity to hold out or bear up in the face of difficulty. It speaks of fortitude. It speaks of patience. It speaks of tenacity. Just take one step at a time. It's that simple. And you will make it one step at a time. And you know what? It's easy to tell you to hang in there. That's the easy part. But it, that wouldn't be possible without this final point. And that point is this. Look up. Look up. Verse 2 and 3 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning his shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful man so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. It's all about him. It's not about us. We are in the middle of it, yes, but, we, but he is with us. And he has showed us how to run. He has showed us how to be effective. He has showed us how to be successful. He ran to his very death. But God raised him up. 
Athletes sometimes speak of developing the ability to shut out all the crowd and all the noise and all the, the distractions when they compete. That's difficult. This morning when I was, I don't even call it running, when I was jogging, <laughs> I had to pretty well just put my focus straight right in front of me and put my head down and just just beat the pavement and just go. Block out those other things. The phrase, fix your eyes, means to look away from all else to fix our gaze on Jesus. This is not a casual glance to make sure he's there. Oh, yeah, oh, there he is. But it's a steadfast gaze. It's giving all of our attention to him. Why is this so important? Because we cannot run this race alone. We cannot run this race alone. And he doesn't expect us to. And he's there, and he will help us finish strong. Let his example encourage and strengthen you tonight. Again, he's already run the race alone, and he doesn't expect us to. He will help us finish strong. I said it probably in the first message of the series. I said it's not important to me just to finish, but it's important to me to finish strong, to finish effective. Because I don't want to just look back and go, okay, I did it. You know, I made it but I finish strong. There's, there's kingdom things that have happened when you look back. There's souls for the kingdom and people that you're taking with you. Even if it's the five that you've tried to encourage to not go the way of the rest, take them with you. Invite them to go along. In light of what he went through for us, we can make it through whatever we might be facing as we keep our eyes on him. He is able, he is willing, and he wants to help us to make it to the finish line. And in conclusion, we need to throw aside everything. Real quick, quick recap. Even though it may be permissible but not helpful, we especially need to get rid of any sin of our lives. That's a must. We must run the race that God has marked for us. You know, it's easy to look at somebody else and say, that looks good. That looks like what I want. That looks like what I, that looks like the path. I, in, in, the, in the world I live in, in some of the nonprofit realm, I look at other things and I go, man, they seem like they've got it all together. What can I do? But I'm reminded every day, God has asked me to do what he's asked me to do don't worry about the rest of me and he may be working in them and it may be wonderful organizations but they they haven't asked me God hasn't asked me to do that I need to do what I've been asked to do I need to get in my lane and I need to put my head down I need to run I just need to go and he will help me each and every day be willing to do what he wants and go where he wants us to go and we must keep our eyes on Jesus not, not on those around us or not those that may have let us down or disappointed us. If we will do these things, God will help us finish strong and we will cross the finish line of this life into heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we honor you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the hope that we have in you. We thank you that we can put our trust in you. And through the trials of life, through the hardships of life, through the joys of life, we can count on you to be there with us. And as we are obedient to you and to your plan, and as we get in your lane, help us to keep our focus upon you. Help us to, to lighten the load with your help as you forgive us of our sin, as you help us to put down the things that easily beset us. We trust you. We honor you. We want to take a few minutes tonight 
as we have continually each week on Wednesday nights. And we open this place up for a time of prayer. And I just ask you this, find a spot to pray. We're not, we won't have a dismissal prayer specific. When you're released, you're released. But ask the Holy Spirit this question wherever you, you choose to pray. Holy Spirit, what do you have for me out of this message tonight? He has something for each every every one of us tonight. There is something. So as we pray, ask the Holy Spirit, what do I need to receive from this? In Jesus' name, let's pray.